Somebody get oh. Gramp out of the armchair. <laughs> <laughs> it's been that kind of day. It's been that kind of week. It's been that kind of year. Kind of month. Everybody needs a nap. Oh, man. Oh, more I'd power to those of you who can. I can't nap. I really can't. I have to I'd be exhausted to nap. to nap. Napping is always good. Napping is highly recommended, especially if you're trying to imagination time your way out of a plot problem. Just saying. I don't know. I've been I've been aggressively reading a uh, a lit RPG book. Well, it's sort of lit RPG, but uh, I've been reading enough to where the last couple of nights, elements of its magic system have bled into my dreams and been part of my dreams. <laughs> so clearly, there there is something there that is tickling your subconscious, and it has unlocked stuff and it's getting into your REM sleep and show me where the lit RPG touched you Terry in my mind space your is mind space me. it's poking the his gray, gray matter. matter his little gray matter oh his little gray matter is so cute wow there's people in chat hello people in chat I know. what the hell y'all I know it's like they expected us to start on time or something I want you all to know, those of you who complain that we don't start on time, we do. We start at the zero. The problem is there is a mm -hmm. delay to when the YouTube stream actually picks up of about five or six seconds. Yep. So that's why it looks like we don't start on time. Mm -hmm. You so just have I'm, to be patient. I'm trying to get better about hitting that button, you know, five or six seconds before so that we, we go live when we go live. But we haven't got that, that way. So anyway. That's just so you understand a little bit behind the scenes, so to speak. <laughs> just start 30 minutes early so the stream has enough time to catch up. You oh, know, it's not that bad. Yeah. Like if only show. you know what the first half hour was in the pre-show. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. it. <laughs> that's okay. I almost tried to get on by plugging my uh, um, microphone receiver into the wrong port. So it's, you know, don't ask. Wrong USB cord. Oh, okay. The one for power instead of the one for actual uh, communication. So, you know, it's just that kind of day. Howdy, folks, Noted. and welcome to another episode of the Dev Robot Society. I am Paul E. Cooley. Joining me as always is Veronica Jaguer and Terry Nixon. How the hell are y'all? You said as always. I wasn't here last week. None of us were here last week, so I guess I got a I, I got a pass. So. Um... <laughs> Never mind. Well, see, you went on a cruise. I did. I went driving to see an eclipse. And mm -hmm. Paul, basically, who knows what Paul does when he's by himself? I, I don't know. We probably don't want to know what you were doing, Paul. I was handling certain things and doing other certain things and then going to a club. I see. You know, most people don't talk about handling their things in public. I didn't say I was handling my things. I said I was handling things. Oh, so you were handing other people's things. I if you drop the sexual innuendo, that might actually be about correct. <laughs> yeah, but what's the fun in that? Uh, for accuracy, I don't know, for, for removing the ambu ambiguity. you know. There was no like ambiguity in what I was saying. I was snake dancing, Antoine. <laughs> <laughs> I went to, what was it, Punk Disco. Punk and it was just, disco. Punk disco. Ooh. That's what they called it. But it was really mainly just I was expecting dark modern stuff that was that had disco beats and things like that. They didn't really do that. I was kind of kind of disappointed. Very disappointed. You saw me with a cobra. Was it a spitting cobra? <laughs> <laughs> Again with the innuendo. Wow. The cobra wow. bit him and died. <laughs> <laughs> he was such a poisonous viral per but yeah. Vile person that when the cobra bit him, the cobra died. I get it. I like that. Wow. So as I was saying, <laughs> what the hell's been going on, V? <laughs> How was oh, your wow. cruise? Tell us about the cruise. Oh, so it was awesome. It was abs it was so cool. And um, so I went in feeling 
kind of like a snob because <gasps> what? Um, well, okay, so we you have to understand my the mighty ginger and I cruise a lot, and part of it's because we're in Florida. We're literally forty five minutes from Port Canaveral, and to essentially to pay to be in an all inclusive hotel with good food and activities and a pool and ocean right there for us, it, it works. So we've done a lot of cruises and this, this audiobook conference, essentially what they did was they arranged a huge group rate and then they did programming on the cruise ship related to audiobook narrators. So the, um, yes, we do. Okay. Like I've got, I've got my, I've got my cruise loyalty points with one cruise line. It's enough that I can get like cute extras and it's really nice. Um, and, when I am older, I am totally going to be one of those people that does back-to-back cruises so I can sit someplace in the shade with coffee and write. So I, I don't I, have a lot of big aspirations, but that's one of them. What I want to know here is uh-huh. some of the perks of this this uh, particular cruise. Did they like bring in people with different accents to go ahead and just talk at you? No, although I did. I did. Although I did meet a dialect coach. Um because he was one of the other narrators and I got to hear him at at these events. One of the things that often happens is you have group coaching and everybody brings in like, like a two or three minute piece and you narrate it or you perform it. And then the coach gives you feedback. And a lot of times the coaches are casting directors from publishing houses. And which is great because for those of us who don't get out a lot, to other uh, like professional get-togethers. <laughs> Call out my cruise line. How dare you? Um, <clears throat> fun fact: I've actually won trivia on Royal Caribbean. I have my very very fancy keychain to prove it. Anyway, um, so you get to essentially you're in a group of like 10 people. Everybody goes and reads and you get to listen to people read. So it's a lot of vicarious learning with different coaches. I got to work with one casting director um, who she cast for a couple different uh, groups. I got to read for a casting director with Simon and Schuster and I got to read for a casting director with Macmillan. And that was great because now these people have met me. And when you do the, when you do it at like, like more formal conferences, it's hard to have like conversation and get to know you time. But here, you know, you're, everyone's going and having dinner together. People are meeting up for breakfast or lunch. There's a lot of downtime to just chat. And so it was nice to do that and to meet other narrators in the community. Um, I got to sit and talk with Travis Baldry. So my little fangirl heart was going, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. But he remembered me from meeting me at APAC in New York um, like six years ago, which was bizarre. But I was like, oh, hi. I didn't think you remembered. Oh, yeah, of course I remember. We talked about games and this and that. And I'm just like, just keep, part of me is like, this is great. And I'm like, just keep talking. Keep talking. This is fantastic. Um, But yeah, it was cool. And I already signed up for next year my i'm getting the vapors it is it it is a joy to watch someone who has a fantastic command of the craft and be able to explain what he does and how he does it so just like the the vocal shifts and twists and how to approach different characters it, it was it was just really cool Awesome. I got to I got to nerd out watching people work. And I got to pet dolphins. So. Mm-hmm. So yeah. And I found out um that I have a contract coming in for a book that will be published by Bayon. So, congrats. I will be congrats. I will be writing the seat where I put it. So, I will be collaborating on 
the sequel to um, the Brainship series. So I'll be writing with Mercedes Lackey. Oh, awesome. And collaborating on a sequel there. So the outline got approved and it's going to be, so we've actually started to write the first chapter already, but there's a contract Excellent. and yeah. So I get to split write stories and play. So it, it, it's good stuff is there. There are a couple like bumps here and there, but yeah, stuff's cool. And I didn't come back sunburned. So That's a positive. Win. There. Yes. Just to celebrate your, your cruise and all that you did on it, I posted a link to uh, Tim Curry as Dr. Poole, the elocution expert. Ah, uh, yes. You do and that like huge. every other week, man. It's, it's you can never see too much Tim Curry. That's the way it is. You can never eat too much Tim. No, never mind. <laughs> anyway, uh, different kind of curry. Science fiction <laughs> double feature. Hello, I see you. <laughs> Eaten my. <laughs> what about you, Terry? What the hell have you been up to? I'm finishing reading up the book that I am ready to turn in. I had hoped to wrap it up tomorrow, but it's going to be Monday. So it'll get turned in on tax day. My wife has been busy doing taxes, so we'll both wrap up all of our long-term projects all at once. Find out how much money we owe the government. Yeah, I need to do taxes. Yeah, you kind of do. That, that, that mention this on... week has been rough. <laughs> Allow me to assure you that Monday is not so far away. Yeah, I kind of know that. I kind of know that. But um, we went and saw the eclipse. That was that was interesting. The sun came back, right? It disappeared. I didn't know if it was going to come back. I'm, I'm pretty sure it hasn't come back yet. If, if I was leaving, Shit. I wouldn't come back either. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> But yeah, it was fun. I, I have no complaints. Got to travel around with the wife, test out a car, test drive a car. It was interesting. Now I'll get to do more driving this week. More driving, more driving, more driving. Driving to Alabama. Abalama? Abalama. Abalama. My mom was from Abalama. I don't think I've ever been there. I think I've driven through there, but I don't think I've ever been there for you anything. Know, I don't I've know that we've, we should, times. we should, we should talk about conspiracy theories about the eclipse. You know, I hear that it's not really the sun, the moon that blocked out the sun, that it was something else. It was God. Cause God was angry at us. It's not or a is death it star. Because it could have been a death star. A death star. A death star. It, it could just, it, what asteroid? It was aliens, man. It was aliens. They moved the moon so that they could Russian hide themselves. Russian spherical space station coming in to spy on North America and then slowly moved back. It was actually was a Chinese spy balloon that just kept pace with the sun, making us <laughs> think that it was that it was an eclipse. That was one big, big one, one big ass <laughs> space balloon. Holy shit! <laughs> mm -hmm. Holy shit! Yeah, it's a clone sun. <laughs> as soon as the moon covered up the sun, they took it and replaced it with one that was functionally identical. So what they do the old one? There's the question. You know, so, I've been dealing just... with crazy for two weeks, and this is just more of it. <laughs> well, I got it. They, they had to they used the opportunity to replace the batteries. Well, you gotta change the batteries sooner or later. I know, right? Have you tried turning it off and turning it back on again? It's all ball bearings these days. Give me some 401. Try it now. Ball <laughs> I mean, just think of it a blue screened right in the middle. Uh, There's pictures of one of those. Uh, um, it's the billboard, but it's the one that has the electronics on it rather than mm -hmm. being pasted on that it crashed and had a blue screen in fog, so it looked like the world had a blue screen. I've seen that picture. I don't even Didn't... care if it was done by, if, it, if it's fake. It was just cool again. It was kind of cool. Didn't the sphere in Vegas at one point blue screen? Yes, it did. You see? <laughs> That's what you want as a marketing right there. 
<laughs> I think this next trip, I want to go over and see the sphere. I want to see. I want to see that. I missed out last time. I didn't get to see it. I That's would, true. but I think I would just the it would be way way too much like sensory, and I would be nauseous and headachey. Mm. Uh, I'll just I'll just wind up like looking out the the like the landing windows at the lobby, going, "What is it this morning?" Oh, look, it's ducks. Ducks this morning. Oh, well, it could be worse, I guess. You're right. It could be a Raiders logo. So, Paul, I realize that it's far, far, far too soon to ask, but do you think you're going to go to Vegas? I don't think that's going to happen. I kind of suspected that would be the case. Yeah, I don't think that's going to happen. Well, I mean, yeah, I'll miss going, actually. It would be kind of therapeutic, but I don't think that's in my future this year. I think it's just going to be... One log slog after another slog. So we'll see how that goes. Um, I'll just say getting old. Maybe sucks. I could get like a, maybe I could get a cardboard cut out of Paul and take it with me everywhere that I go inside the convention. Everybody be like, who's that well, doofus you're carrying around? <clears throat> well, no. So one year at Balticon, um, when Nathan Lowell couldn't be there, I forget who it was. Somebody made a little puppet Nathan Lowell, and everybody went around and got pictures with him. So all that we need is to make a little puppet coolie, and we can go around and take pictures. Just don't stick any pins in it, you know, because uh, don't use it as a voodoo doll, please. When you find somebody We're that's not artistic, be in New Orleans, thing, be in Vegas. It, it, instead of being a sock, we need to like take take like a bobblehead and need to like do some painting to it and make it look like him. Uh, you can get custom pop figures. Oh, custom pop figures of Paul. That would be no. Different. I got I got them for my kids. That that was like one of their their Christmas presents this year. I got them each custom pop figures, and like got their names on the boxes and everything. Like thirty bucks each. It was pretty cool for what it was. Huh. Well, this is yeah, Vegas. We, uh, Tim saying you know at Balticon there was a Dave Robeson impersonator because he couldn't make it. Maybe we could hire somebody to be a Paul impersonator. Well, I know that was that was Starla Hutchton. She wound up dressing as That's Jay Robeson. Oh, it was amazing. Yes, yes. It was amazing. Um, but the other thing I thought is if we can't do like, you know, like a, a little sock puppet sort of thing. Um, the crochet, the little amiguri puppet things. So I'm like, huh, do I have enough yarn? Could I do this? How much gray do I have? <laughs> do I? That's fucking I cold. Oh, that actually. shit's mean. Damn. I, I think know. she found a big old thing of gray. I can always pull stuff apart. So I got some gray there. Got some pink. There's some blue. You know, I could, I I always love an excuse to get more yarn. JR says, can they pull off the old curmudgeon? I'm not even going to try to dissect that sentence. That is the required benchmark for the faux Paul. So which portion of them are they supposed to be pulling off? Anyway, uh, so I've had an interesting couple of weeks deal with uh, family stuff, and I'll kind of leave it there. But if you ever need to talk about Parkinson's disease, give me a shout. Um, so... My writing has gotten really, really upset. My writing, every my writing has crashed. Everything has crashed. So I got to get back at this. I got to basically somehow find a way to get past everything, carve out an hour or two a day and play before I completely lose my fucking mind. So I'm sitting here going, I know all the ticks, the trips and to all the, tr- yeah, all the trips. All the tricks tips and, and tricks. tips. Thank you. Something on those lines. You speak good English. Um, and yet, I'm not practicing any of them. Why? You're intentionally know. ignoring them? Maybe that's the case. Sometimes, or... sometimes when you're doing something, you know the rules and you intentionally don't follow them because that's what suits what you want to do. Right. <laughs> Did you turn your writing off and out back on again? <laughs> Sadly, he turned it off and it's not turning back on. It's not turning back on. I'm 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 so pissed at myself because I'm I'm sitting there. I've got the the scene up. 
it should be a great scene. It should be a horrific scene. It should really set the tone for the rest of the book. You, you know what you need it. to have, don't you? You need to make a video about how you talk about, you know, I'm trying to write, but it's just not coming. The words aren't coming. I can't seem to do this. And you have somebody else come in just ignoring the fact that you're sitting there dressed like a redneck, and they lean over and they type on your thing there and go, try it now! You're just going to keep running with that joke, aren't you? Well, Long past after so, it gets gin splints. And so the, it's limping. The, there is something to that, to be fair. But that really only works when you're writing collaboratively. And sometimes just to like get things jump started is sometimes it's easier to critique a shit idea before putting down something else. Mm -hmm. And I know that oftentimes when I'm writing with my writing group and people are stuck, like, Oh, I can't figure out how to start. I'll type something and I may put down something that I know is going to get skewered, but at least people are doing something. At least there's something there that can be changed and fixed. So that is one way to do it. Although if if someone did that and then try it now came in my ear, I'd probably haul off and smack them. But that's me. <laughs> Your tolerance may vary. Your tolerance may vary. But I mean, no, I know what you're statement. talking. Yeah. But I know what you're talking about. Because when one of the things that always happens at any any professional development thing whether it's a writing thing whether it's a narrator thing when i was in higher ed if i went to a, a higher ed thing it was great learning everything and learning all these tricks and then in those quiet moments i realized oh shit i'm doing so much wrong or i'm not doing enough or there's stuff that i should be doing and i started doing it once upon a time but i'm not doing it right now so what the hell am i going to do now and it's like, how do I, how do I dial back and how do I, how do I restart? How do I find the, 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 the skeletal structure of all these good habits that I should be doing and pick things back up? My advice to you on that is you need to change one thing at a time. Yes. Because if you try to change a bunch of things at once, you're not going to be able to tell what's working and what's not working if something still doesn't work. Right. It's like working on a car. If you replace 14 parts, you don't know which of them is actually bad. So if you're trying to, to, to reset the way you're doing something, whether it be narration, whether it be writing, change one thing and evaluate the results. Mm -hmm. Give it a little bit of a test drive, see how that works. If it doesn't mm -hmm. do what you need it to do, or if it, even if it does, but it's not far enough, change something else. Right. Mm. And I mean, for me, I knew that when, oh gosh, and this was a couple of years ago, I had kind of the same thing hit and I was part of a narrator group and a bunch of people started doing the exercises from the artist's way by Julia Cameron. And the first thing in that was like morning pages, write three pages every day of just stream of consciousness, whatever. And the idea being that you sit down and do it and it helps you organize your thoughts. And it's, it's just, it's a habit of anywhere from a half hour to 45 minutes. Now I was doing it. I did it for a couple of years, but then I kind of let it go off because I needed the time in the morning and people are like, get up early. I am not one of those people who will ever get up at five o'clock. Did it for too long. I'm not doing it again. I wish so, I could say that, but my cat has other ideas. There were yeah. a number of things that I've, I've went to a number of different time to courses, listen to writers talk about things that mm -hmm. they do that make their writing better, that improve their productivity. And after a while, I discovered that I've hit an acceptable level of production, an acceptable level of skill, even though I still work on improving my skill. Mm -hmm. But making changes to the way I'm doing things now becomes something that's harmful to my process. So while I'm not saying I'll never change, 
I am saying that I see no real reason to change because at a certain level of experience, you found something that works. Yes. And if you ever do that, don't just gratuitously change it. No, I, I totally agree. And it's, and that's the thing. It's not necessarily changing something in my, nothing's changing in my like core narrator process. I'm not, I don't need to find new warmups. I, I don't need to necessarily change the way I prep text. It's all the other, it's, it's the, it's the business organization. It's the, what I realized is it was a really, really good question. Um, during one of the sessions is when something comes up, be it an offer to collaborate, be it a, you know, a writing project that comes up, a narration project that comes up, a volunteer opportunity that comes up. One of the first questions should be, is this going to set me ahead in my career a year from now? Or is it going to set me back? Mm. And that, that was a little mind blowing because I realized that with some of the stuff I had been doing, it was siphoning off not just time, but creative and emotional and mental energy that I could have been using to get more time in the booth, to get more time putting words on the page. Because one of the trade-offs that happens with some of the stuff that I've been getting cast to narrate, it's really intense. And I can usually, on a good day, I can put in two hours in the booth. Once I, f I put in like, it was about two hours, I, I could not do anything else work-related that day. Like, I was wrecked. I had, I was narrating a mom who's daughter had died and it was dealing with all of this grief and all these really really heavy things and i got out of the booth and like i'm gonna crash on the couch for an hour and watch <laughs> sitcoms and try to laugh because your your brain doesn't want to do anymore same thing if you're writing something that's really taxing or really heavy because part of you is getting put out there how do you recover if you're committing yourself to things that are just sapping your energy, like, you know, even just little bits, you know, a thousand cuts will still kill just slowly. And they hurt like, yeah. oh, do they hurt? Yeah. Especially with the, with the lemon juice sprayer. I mean, that's a bitch. That's been the last two weeks, death by a thousand cuts over stuff I had no control over. Mm -hmm. Early, early on in my career, I got approached to do short stories and other works that took things away from, from what I wanted to do for myself. And I did them because I thought they were good advertising opportunities and I haven't regretted doing that. But there came a time in the career when I said, do I have time to do those anymore? And after reflecting on it, I said, I don't, I, I would be better served for my own career, focusing on the novel work that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And, and I had to start turning those down. And in the same way, writing my own stuff is something that I enjoy doing a lot. I mean, I wouldn't be a writer if I didn't enjoy writing my own stuff. Mm -hmm. But when Jeff Cheney approached me to do a long-term collaboration like he did, after reflecting on the possible benefits of doing that, growing my audience and increasing my income, but at the cost of setting everything that I was writing for myself aside, I decided that was the right course to take and I haven't regretted it. It was the right choice to make and it worked out for me. Yes. But it's, it's hard. It's hard thinking about it that way and mm -hmm. setting aside what you want to do with what is best to do. Yes. And also recognizing that there are some non-negotiables when you are the primary caregiver be it for parents be it for kids be it for both there are some times where you have to say i can't i can't commit as much time to this project in the short term and i mean granted that's that's always one of my pet peeves with any kind of um, professional 
workshop conference when people talk about productivity because and i'm going to apologize now for hopping up on the soapbox uh oh but, stand back everyone what get cozy in this chair but a lot of the folks who who present and talk about productivity and starting off in a career and how they're able to be super productive they may not have those family responsibilities. They may not have those caretaker responsibilities. And so they completely discount the fact that you've got, so my example, um, I know that for the next three years, I'm not going to be able to do stuff, you know, gung ho, because I will still have one teenager at home. Mm -hmm. And that one teenager is, it would it would be so much easier if she sucked at her sport and she doesn't. She's good. Life is hard Damn. when things are successful. Oh, right? God forbid you have a successful child. I mean, uh, fuck that. And I and the thing is, I want to support her, and that means, yeah, I'm going to keep working on my stuff. But as a responsible parent, as the parent who takes on the lion's share of kids' stuff, means I'm going to be responsible for transportation. I'm usually the one responsible for homework stuff, and I'm going to be the one responsible for helping to get her to, you know, sports practices and trainings and, you know, extra meets so that she can be seen by recruiters and coaches and whatnot. Because at the end of the day, at the end of those three years, I want to make sure that she goes to the university that she wants to go to, and hopefully they'll pay for it because she's that good. But that means that I can't put in four hours. I, I can't have four finished hours of recording time a day. I'd have to ignore everybody else. But there will be a time for that later. And there will be a time for that later where I could spend two hours writing and four hours in the booth and, you know, three hours at the gym and all of these crazy things. But not right now. And a lot of people who talk about a lot of the, all this crazy productivity, they neglect to point out that either they are not the they are not the point caregiver, or they are relying upon someone who is supporting their career Correct. by taking care of all of the executive function things so that they can focus. And there is nothing wrong with that if it's acknowledged and recognized. <laughs> So I've never anyway. had kids, but let me tell you how to parent. <laughs> You're doing it wrong. I'm doing it wrong. Totally wrong. I know. I gave the oldest your books to read. Now look what happened to him. <sighs> I got to say that a number of people that do have kids, they're doing it wrong. <laughs> and I've seen them. <laughs> I mean, Just because you have kids does not make you a good parent. <laughs> no, I, no, that's not what I was saying. Sadly. Saying. That's no, no, it saying. does not. No, it does not. But the there's there is something to be said for recognizing that not every for every success story or every person that stands up there and says this is how you can be super productive and get five thousand words a day and finish your book in a month. You know what? What are they? aside or what are they offloading to others in their household or within their their sphere of responsibility you know what are they trading off and if you're not able to do that you just need sometimes you just need to like step back and forgive yourselves like this is not this is not the time or as someone once told me it's not the season it's not the season for that and seasons change not everything is permanent survivorship bias Ooh, i like that yeah i like that too yeah or mom guilt mom guilt works st hoover says i've realized mm -hmm. lately that i need to write less every day to get more done overall i can write double what i do every day but if i do write that much regularly a crash is always inevitable i i run into the same sort of thing if i try to do too much i i crash and what i found works best for me in my process it was explained to me that sometimes the best way to achieve something hard isn't to push somebody up higher, like say climbing a wall, it's to lower the wall rather than push them up higher. 
And yes. if you go ahead, for me anyway, if I lower what I'm doing every day and don't try to overdo it, I end up producing more over the long term because I don't have the days off where I just can't do anything because I've overextended. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a good way of putting it. All right. Things to think about. Things yeah. to think about. It's, 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 it's taken me years hard. of figuring this out to where I can yeah. actually do it. So it, it was a hard learned lesson because I felt bad. I felt guilty that I wasn't doing everything I could to improve the number of words that I was doing. Mm -hmm. One thing that's really interesting to me is I, I was recording an ancient trap and I stopped because I hated everything and nothing sounded right when I played it back. Everything was all fucked up and I was just like, I suck at this. I need to stop. So it's been a couple of weeks. So I loaded the files yesterday because I was like, I think there's maybe a compressor setting that I had wrong and maybe that's why everything was trash. And I went back and I listened to what I'd cut and it sounded perfectly fucking fine. Mm -hmm. That's where my headspace has been at for a while. So uh, that has been something to get over is basically self-sabotage. One of the, it's not the same thing as what you're going through with that. But one of the very earliest lessons that I learned as a writer is that I cannot judge the quality of my own work. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how it is for everyone else, but it is, it is completely true to me. When I first wrote, started writing, I said, this is just junk. This is just crap. And other people say, no, it's not. It's good. And that kept happening over and over again to the point where I said, obviously, I am the problem here and I need to stop judging my own work and just trust that I'm doing something right because everyone else seems to like it. Yep. That's very tough. And it's hard. It's not easy. Mm -hmm. Some of us want yeah. to be Raymond Carver at heart. That's just the way it is. Instead, we're a pulp writer. It's difficult sometimes to admit your uh, station in life. Zender says he's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for quoting Taylor Swift. I appreciate that. Oh, Brett says Stephen King threw away Carrie and Tabitha got it from the trash. Yep. That's, I'm pretty sure that's in on writing. Yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right. Yeah, I almost, yeah. I almost am beginning to wonder if, if I just need to remember that I am who I am and just fucking do it. But that's Dude. so goddamn hard. Here's the, here's the thing. You've got plenty of people that sing your praises and love what you do. If you're feeling criticism, it's your critical brain judging your work and you just need to turn it off. You need to accept that you can't judge what you're doing and let other people judge for you. Hmm. Those bastards. It's hard, but if you can start just saying, I'm putting this out, I have personal things there, but let's see what everybody says about it. After the first few times where it works out, it's much easier to turn that critical brain off and say, I'm on, I'm just wrong. I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. Out of this equation, my judgment is wrong. I'm just going to write. And the other thing is that you've, you have fans. You have, it, it's plural. I mean, I can't say more than three, plural, three of them. <laughs> well, yeah, there's my parents and my uncle. I mean, what are you going to do? Uh, so there you go. But you've, you have fans and at the end of the day they're still reading and enjoying what you write you can't think that little of them that you think that their opinion sucks not everybody else can be wrong can they mm. 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 so we were talking about resetting <laughs> there's also resetting the yeah that was an awkward segue we we're talking about resetting <laughs> It's also thinking about resetting your writing. So for instance, mm -hmm. one thing that's been dogging me is I feel like I'm not giving enough description. Ah, uh, okay. I and run usually, into that a lot. And usually I, I've said this before, um, when I'm writing and when I'm in the groove, it's a movie. It's mm -hmm. a movie playing in my head. Sound effects, the whole fucking nine yards. Everyone can be wrong. Um, 
I've had problems getting back into the movie space. It keeps chopping up and breaking down, breaking down, breaking down. It drives me absolutely shit that nuts because I've never had this this much of a problem with that before. It's kind of crazy. I am extremely limited in the amount of description that I give. And I worried about that a ton. And yet it has not been a problem. It may be it may be lazy writing to go ahead and let other people fill in the blanks. But it's powerful when you do that. If you have yeah. them filling in the blanks, they take ownership of the story. But I think there's some points where, especially if you're writing suspense, where you have to be more descriptive about what's going on. There has to be an investigation of countenance. There has to be an investigation of body language. There has to be an investigation of exactly what the person is seeing because part of getting across that tingle is having that person recognize enough of those details. And usually you have to give them one more on top of what you think you have to give them in order to, for them to focus the image in their mind the way you want them to. Remember the rule of three. Still. The rule of three, my friend, give them three bits of description for it. Ah, but then there's three bits of description for the wall, three bits of description for the person. Three bits of only if it's important if the, is the wall important is the bush important is the what's person the important what's on the wall is important <laughs> what the person left behind is a stain is important yeah, so then the, then you're only looking at one small bit of the wall you don't have to describe the whole wall just a little bit i think when you're if you're figuring out descriptions it's what do you need what do you need to tell what do you need in order for the reader to appreciate what you're seeing also one of the things that i picked up from dean wesley smith's uh courses about depth and writing is the description has to bring emotion with it you're bringing emotion of whatever this is through to the reader so if it's just a bland description and it has no buy-in from the uh, person then it's pretty useless it needs to be tinged by the the person that's viewing it in the story their opinions matter they have to bleed through there you have this wall he comes into the room and there displayed in the center of the wall lit by bright lights was this small painting that was obviously highly prized. And then the next line says, it was hideous. <laughs> and it starts the description of just how ugly it was. Mm -hmm. That may be that character's opinion of that. Obviously, the person that put it on the wall had a different opinion. Mm -hmm. But if you're writing something description-wise, each character can see the same thing and have a different opinion, and it needs to reflect in the description that they see that object for. If you're not using description as a filter to bring the opinions of the character through to the reader, then it really doesn't have much of a place. Yeah, one of the things I got dinged for in Tattoo was Jackson describes the George R. Brown. And I hate that building. I fucking vilely hate it. So I had to give like an entire paragraph of Jackson thinking what a piece of shit it was. <laughs> well, and that's the thing. If the character has an opinion about it, and that and the and the characters having that opinion is important to fleshing out the character in the mind of the reader then yeah have them describe something yeah i mean you could have somebody who hates tiramisu and they're going to describe it it's like oh this square of oh why is it chocolate why is it soggy and who decided to put you know like weird consistency creamy frosting whatever on top of liquor and soggy cookies what dumb stupid idea was this now, i don't care if they say it's delicious it looks like shit if you it's read, gonna help color the, the, and for the record tiramisu is delicious so if you read the lion the witch in the wardrobe and you were tricked into thinking that turkish delight tasted good you may be entitled to compensation <laughs> Tiramisu is a dessert, Jr. Tiramisu, it, it, it's an Italian dessert. It's cookies soaked in coffee liqueur. 
and then it's got layers of cream and I want to say it's mascarpone um, and heavy cream and cocoa. um, And it is honest to God, delicious. And it's very complicated to make. I have yet to try it someday though. To, before I leave off on the description completely, there's the, the old uh, saw in writing that every line has to serve a purpose and it's better if it serves more than one purpose in your writing. I am not nearly so dedicated to my writing that I try to make sure that every line serves a purpose because that seems counterintuitive to me. I just tell the story the way I tell it. But for description, I believe that it is important that it serves a purpose. If it's just... I was walking down the street and there was a blue car that drove by. If it's not actually relevant to anything, it has no place there. That blue car better show up again. That blue car better show up again. Mm -hmm. It better actually be important. If you're writing description, especially detailed description about something that isn't critical for your story, Mm -hmm. then it probably shouldn't be there. Yeah. There's there's one thing to... Okay, go ahead. I was going to say, there's one... If you're... For certain genres, it does make sense if you need to like lay landmines and maybe something will go off and maybe something won't and you need to mislead. That's there is a purpose to that. But, you know, the whole bit Chekhov's gun, you show it on the mantle in the first act, it must go off in the second. If you violate that too often, then the story is just going to seem bloated. Mysteries, for example, they have lots of things in there where the description of the people makes everyone look guilty. Everyone is a suspect. And that's the way it has to be in a mystery. Because if you've only got one person that looks guilty, well, that's, that's, that's not exactly a mystery right there. If you go ahead and you do it like uh, Agatha Christie stories, Murder on the Train, everybody better have a role to play in this. Sassy, what do you think? She thinks, what are you doing? I'm innocent, Dad. I'm completely innocent. See, look at this face. You could never accuse me of anything. I'm a perfect Floofy angel. Floofy would never have killed anyone. Throw her brother from the train. That's the the movie. (laughs) (laughs) The cats toss everything else off the train. Why not the brother? Well, you know, it's true. If this was actually a flat earth environment, the cats would have knocked everything off by now. I'm pretty sure you're correct in that assessment. Yep. Pretty sure. I was going to say one more, well, one thing about description. If you have a place you're continually going back to, don't describe it again mm-hmm. unless something has changed. I got characters going through like a borehole or something in mining. I don't only need to describe that borehole 90 fucking times because it doesn't matter. You are only telling them, okay, this is what the rock looked like. This is how the walls look. And it's pretty much uniform throughout. And only talk about it again if there is an imperfection or oddity in the normalcy of what it is. The skull of your friend buried in the wall. That's possible. Oh, hey, look, there's Fred again. <laughs> <laughs> that that could be, that that I would do because that is a, a uh, running gag throughout the whole thing. Maybe yeah. you could find a... Maybe you could find the toe that goes with the tag in the wall. <laughs> Read whispers. Um, uh, or yeah, just walking by. Oh, boop! Fred's nose and keep going. It becomes yeah. ritual, and then exactly. and then suddenly, after like you know a hundred times, the end that that particular part of the skull is worn shiny from so many people going boop. Oh, what's worse like, is you don't explain Fred. You don't explain it at all. It just is there. It's like the CSI episode where they went to one of these, you know, Museum of Horrors thing, and one of the displays was actually a dead body buried up inside of something plastered over to look like it was fake. Nice. I saw that that, uh, episode of Tales from the Crypt. I also saw it in House of Wax. Mm. It's a trope. Mm. It is a trope. Tropes. I, I got a book on tropes. Where did I, did I put it up there somewhere? Oh, God. Well, now we're going to lose Terry for the next 55 minutes as he tries to look around and find this goddamn book. Well, I just picked it up. <laughs> it can't have ran far, damn it. I don't think it'll run at all. The book's got no legs. Yeah, but his cats do, and they probably cart off and carry off random pieces of his office when he's not looking. Somewhere in this house is a stapler, and the cats just have it. 
There's a small feline library that they've cultivated. Exactly. Trope thesaurus. Oh my god. Hmm. I backed the Kickstarter because I thought it would be interesting, and I still need to read it. <laughs> that looks am. really interesting. It's too bad, you know. The printing. I, I haven't looked at the the quality of the work inside, but the layout. The layout could have been done a little bit better. And the back mm. cover, it like almost almost oh. cuts off Ooh. where you can't read yeah. the edge. But the interior, let me just drop it into the middle of this here. There's lots of, of stuff like this. It just it just doesn't it doesn't seem there's no indentation and that bothers me. Mm. Yeah, that mm. would bother me too. JR says I bought the world building books by Gary Gygax from the recent Kickstarter. That should be interesting. I don't know that I even saw that one. Maybe I did see it. I'm not sure. I was going to say, I'm surprised you didn't know what that was. Gary Gygax not. is dead, so he's probably, you know, not running his own Kickstarter. Probably not. Mm. <laughs> it's, probably, it's probably his son, Luke, that was doing it. Unless there was a seance involved and, or body possession or something, and that would just be weird. Body possession? Yeah, you know, like, you know, what, what, demonic possession? The haunted sock puppet. There's a really good movie, probably going to be very underrated on Shudder right now, called Bag Hint. And it's very pertinent to this conversation, but I'm not going to say anything more than that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I enjoyed it. You should watch it. He says they were just released. Oops. They were just released from the estate and Troll Lord Games got the rights to republish them. Ha uh -huh, okay. They had the books for the first run and had to unpublish them while the will was disputed. I honestly don't know how much I would want to look at the world building from Gary Gygax's point of view. Because when he started D&D, &D, he treated it more as a miniatures game. So world building wasn't necessarily all that important to him. Not in the same way it is to a role-playing game. Nothing against him. Nothing against what he does. But um, mm -hmm. I'm just not sure that it would be something I would be interested in. Hmm. Hmm. Not the sock puppet. Meat puppets. His late, later works got very granular. So does sugar. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. True. I don't know what that statement is supposed to mean. His deep dive into Jehovah's Witnesses? What? Somehow I'm not sure that that's the same Gary Gaia. <laughs> I Christians mean, what kind are? of class is that? I don't know. I'm scared now. Is, is that a monk? Is that a bard? Is that... I don't know. I do not know. What do you think, chat? Well, there are kinds of things we need to look at. Declutter. Yeah. How else? Yeah. So oh, I am doing. Image of this witness. Got it. Oh, okay. Sh share yeah. a link in the uh, live channel, Jr., so we can look at it later. Yeah. I mean, so I am. I am like doing my own like reset after everything and starting back with my morning pages. But I have because I'd done the artist way before. Um, I actually bought like several of her books. And the second one is, what is it? Walking in this world, the practical art of creativity. It might be a little woo-woo, happy universe for some of y'all, but I like it. Um, Nothing and, says that you can't get good stuff out of something that may be a little woo-woo. No, and it's, it's not. And that's the one thing that I do appreciate about her writing is that wherever you find your creative center... So you can be, you can believe in someone, you can believe in something, you can be an atheist, you can be agnostic, and it will still work because you can still take it and, and, and transfer and whatever. But the, the three things that the author points out is that you do, essentially you do a brain dump every day, stream of consciousness, brain dump every day. You set aside at least one hour a week to do an artist's date or what I've, I go for a wander wherever I just, I go for going a walk about. Well, there's, okay. Oh, there are two things. You, she also talks about going for walks, just like a 
20 minute walk, no earbuds for me, no playing Pokemon Go while I'm on my constitutional. Paul, don't look at me that way. It was the only way I would walk because I could get points while walking and catching make-believe creatures. But just sitting there and letting your mind go while you're putting one foot in front of the other. But the artist date is stuff that makes you think differently. So it could be going to a bookstore. It could be, I'll, I'll go to like junk bargain stores like Ollie's Warehouse or discount stores and just wander through and see what I find. And it's like, oh, this could be cool or this is bizarre. Antique stores, see what's there. But it's what works for you. And doing that once a week and just giving yourself license because it, it's someplace new that will let your mind think in ways that you don't normally. Hmm. I guess that's a good point. And plus I'm in Florida. There's plenty of weird shit here. <laughs> it's true of everywhere. It, it, trust me. Trust me. I've, I've, yeah. Yeah. I've seen okay. JR weird. has filled the live with, uh, links. Mm -hmm. okay. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Well, we got three minutes left. Less than three. Oh no. What do we do? I don't know. It's a good question. Hmm. The conversation went to a lull. I don't know what yeah, we're going to we do. Yeah, we got a lull. We're in a lull. But we could go back and sleep. You know, a nap is never out of, off the table. Are you saying we should start or end the book as we started the book? There's something to be said for that. There was a mystery that uh, I watched on television. Uh, it was a uh, Tony Hillerman story set on uh, the Navajo reservation with uh, two tribal policemen. And it started off with them finding a dead body and some guy staggering away from the body drunk and thinking he's the killer. And then they went through the entire movie looking at other people that could have been the killer and finding other things going on, and they get to the end of it, and it was that guy. That guy literally was the murderer, and they had solved it in the first 60 seconds of the movie. And then spent the rest of it staggering around. Like the drunk guy. Like the drunk guy. <laughs> That's lazy. That's just lazy. I think it's cute. I think it's trying to play a little too cute, if you know what I mean. Yeah, it's being a little mm -hmm. too much. That's a little crazy. Unless there's something else going on. I guess I'd have to read it to have an opinion on it. A, an informed opinion, obviously. Yeah, Ratash, you're talking naps. <laughs> well, it's out on it's out on video. The movie was actually pretty decent. There's been a couple of uh, Tony Hillman's stuff done as movies, and um, I can recommend watching them. They're well done. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Good to know. Good to know. I'll try to find a link to it and, and see if I can post it in, in live. Where was I? Damn it. Okay, uh, I do have a music recommendation as a soundtrack if you're writing something suspenseful. Okay. It is Much Unseen is Also Here by Lust Mord. It is, a, it is an eldritch horror uh, soundtrack if I've ever heard one. And it's del and, uh, de deliberately, I mean, for instance, some, one of the song titles is Entrails of the God Machine. A shadow cast upon the deep invocation of the nameless one <laughs> hence they shall all be devoured <laughs> it's My really hatchet. good it's really good soundtrack i mean it's it's there's no words or anything there's i don't think there's really any guitars in this either but uh hmm. it's just really good stuff so highly recommend that what's the fallout series fallout's getting some buzz man yeah i started watching it now because i've never I think I had started to play it way back and then just time and capability did yeah. not do any more. Um, so it, it's interesting. And I, there, there've been a handful of, um, of that kind of post-apocalyptic, the, the aboves and belows with, with different stories that I've enjoyed. Um, and I started watching, I've only watched one episode of The Three-Body Problem. I have not read the books, but um, 
at least the first episode was amazingly well done. I really, really liked it because um, I like a good thinking series. Mm. I'm not ready to try it yet. Oh. Not ready. And then watching it. the X Men '97, and that's just that. That's just some good fun. Sit back and yeah, devour. What else? My if wife's been watching like Shogun. It. She thinks Shogun is amazing. I saw that. I think it it, it would probably be up my alley. But I can probably only handle so many alley. stories. I can only handle so many stories in my brain at a time. So I try. I, I will try to binge watch a series and get to the end and then start something else. Um, well, if you oh, next, have next. a comment or question or uh, you want to get us started on some other topic, you can send an email to show at the robot society dot com. You can find me on Mastodon at Paul underscore E underscore Cooley at V-Y-R-S-E dot social. You can find us on Facebook at the Dev Robot Society writing community where we all mingle the madness. You can find us on YouTube at youtube.com slash DRS podcast, where we are almost always live at 3 p.m. Central Standard Time. Like and subscribe so you know when we're live. And if you want to support the show, you can find us at patreon.com slash DRS podcast and find me at coffee.com slash DRS podcast, where for as little as $1 a month, you get access to exclusive live shows like Mistress V reading the dictionary. It can happen. It could happen. And at $10 level, you get your name read. And our $10 patrons are Nate Cosby, Antoine Batts, Tony L. Joy, Rick Shaw, Lisa Slack, Isabel Cushy, and Tim Niederreiter. Thank you to all of our patrons for helping us pay our StreamYard bills and remain on the air. With that, we are going to get out of here so we can see these after dark folks in eight minutes. Wow. Thanks for spending your time. We're going to take naps. Yeah, we're going to take a nap. We'll see you next week.